Hi there, and welcome back to Understanding Medications. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about another one of the general ways in which our medications work. And specifically, in this lesson, we're going to be talking about enzymatic inhibition. And first of all, let's make sure that you understand what enzymes are. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze, or in other words, speed up a reaction. So in the body, there may be a reaction that occurs, but it may take maybe three hours. And with the enzyme, it may speed up that reaction, and the reaction may occur in a few milliseconds or a few thousandths of a second. Now this is depicted in the really simplistic diagram here. The purple is the enzyme and the smaller structure in red is the substrate. A substrate means that it is the substance upon which the enzyme is acting. And as they come into contact, these two molecular structures have kind of a bond, a molecular bond which allows them to bond and allows the reaction to occur. And as that happens, there's going to be a cleaving of the substrate into two different products. Enzymes are really important to a range of biological processes. So given that, it's understandable why a lot of our medications work by inhibiting one of them. So let's try to understand the basics of enzymatic inhibition as it applies to our medications. When you think of enzymatic inhibition, you should immediately think of two major types of enzymatic inhibitors, the reversible inhibitors and the irreversible inhibitors. By far the largest group of enzymatic inhibitors is the reversible inhibitors. And those are divided into at least four subsets. Clinically speaking, the most important group of reversible inhibitors is the competitive inhibitors. In competitive inhibition, the medication binds to the active site of the enzyme and prevents the binding of the substrate. So it is competing with the substrate. Because it is a competition between the medication and the substrate, adding more substrate would normally increase the amount of binding of the substrate. And that is the largest group of reversible enzymatic inhibitors, the competitive inhibitors, and when the medication is fully metabolized, there should be no further effects. Now let's take an example of competitive inhibition to make sure that you understand that. The structure in purple is the enzyme. Let's use the example acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. The structure in red is the substrate, and in this case, the substrate is acetylcholine. When the enzymatic action happens, acetylcholine will degrade to acetate and choline. Each molecule of acetylcholine esterase degrades about 25,000 molecules of acetylcholine per second. And finally, the medication is in yellow. The medication is competing for the active site on the enzyme, meaning that every second that it is in the active site is a second that the enzyme is not degrading its 25,000 molecules of acetylcholine. The other major type of reversible inhibitors that is fairly common is a non-competitive inhibitor. In that case, the inhibitor binds to what we call an allosteric site. It's not the site that's in the active portion of the enzyme, but in a different portion of the enzyme. This diagram denotes a non-competitive inhibitor changing the active site so that the substrate cannot bind. Now let's talk about irreversible inhibitors. If a person is given an irreversible inhibitor of an enzyme, the enzyme can no longer perform its function. An irreversible inhibitor inactivates an enzyme by binding normally covalently to the enzyme and normally at the active site. And you may be thinking right now, what are we going to do without that enzyme? 
the irreversible enzymatic inhibitors are time dependent. So eventually the medication will be degraded at the active site or the enzyme will be replaced. The time that this takes is variable, but it often takes much longer than the half-life of the medication would predict. So from a clinical aspect, you could understand how an irreversible inhibitor is often going to last a lot longer than the effects of a reversible inhibitor. An example is the proton pump inhibitors, such as omeprazole and other medications that end in the suffix prazole. Those have a relatively short half-life of about one and a half hours. And that would normally mean that the medication would have to be taken quite frequently. But because it is an irreversible inhibitor, omeprazole and other irreversible proton pump inhibitors only need to be taken on a daily basis. Irreversible enzymatic inhibition is also important in toxins such as pesticides and anti-infective agents. For instance, many of the nerve gases are irreversible inhibitors of the enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And acetylcholine works all the way through the body. But let's just take the example of what happens at the site of the muscles. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's responsible to instruct the muscles to contract. Without the enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine at the muscle, the acetylcholine continues to stimulate, for instance, the respiratory muscles. And remember what we need in order to breathe. We need to be able to contract the diaphragm, but we need to be able to relax it as well. So contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. And with this nerve gas that's an irreversible inhibitor of that enzyme, it means that there's constant excesses in acetylcholine and constant contraction. So the person succumbs to respiratory distress. We also use irreversible inhibitors when we're uh, targeting infective agents. For instance, penicillin is an irreversible inhibitor of an enzyme which only the bacteria have, but humans don't have. We just found out a bit about the irreversible enzymatic inhibitors, and we now know that they are time dependent. But I have a problem that many people puzzle over, and I'd like you to think about it. Aspirin is an irreversible enzymatic inhibitor of the enzyme called cyclooxygenase, and it's abbreviated as COX. So aspirin inhibits COX enzyme in platelets for the entire nine days of the platelet. And that's the reason that if you're giving blood, they ask you if you have had any aspirin for the past 10 days. They will not use your platelets if you have had aspirin because aspirin irreversibly inhibits the enzyme cyclooxygenase. But the effect of aspirin on that same enzyme in other tissues doesn't last for that long. Otherwise, the anti-inflammatory effect would be much longer than it is. So why is that? Can you think of a reason for the difference? And you were correct if you said that platelets don't have the ability to make more enzymes. Recall that in order to make new proteins, the cell needs a nucleus that contains the DNA. We make a copy of the relevant portion of the DNA, or in other words, we copy the gene that codes for the protein and send that information to another portion of the cell to be translated into a protein. So the platelet will never do this because it doesn't have that DNA that's necessary to make the new enzyme. So when aspirin affects the platelet's cyclooxygenase, the platelet isn't capable of degrading the aspirin, and it's not capable of making new cyclooxygenase.
And as we compare this to what happens inside cells, it's noteworthy that our cells have ways of degrading drugs and toxins that are in the cell. And if it cannot degrade the drug, the cell is capable of replacing the irreversibly inhibited enzyme.